welcome everybody from Minsk. And we also have quite a geography of representatives here. We'll introduce them later on. But first, we welcome into the next discussion under our project called the World Handcock, under which we are going to analyze the long-term effects of the pandemic on international security, especially the security in Euro-Atlantic and European regions. In the past few weeks, we spoke about a number of countries, including also some of the international organizations like NATO and EU. And today, our agenda includes yet another important security organization for the Eurasian region, which is the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Unfortunately, today, despite the fact that we keep doing the discussion and all our research project is done in cooperation with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and its Belarusian office, but its director, Jakob Wallenstein, couldn't uh, join our discussion today. So we send him best regards still, and uh, at the same time, he is sending his best regards to us and all the participants as well. Maybe he will join us later as a viewer and might also submit some comments and questions, who knows. Now it is with great pleasure that I'm introducing our today's participants. I'm quite used that each time we keep saying this, friends, that we have all-star panel here. It's no exception today. Today, among the participants, we have Professor Dmitry Danilov, head of the Department for European Security of the Institute of Europe of the Russian Academy of Sciences. All the best regards from Minsk to Moscow to you, Mr. Danilov. Also not to go too far away from Moscow. We equally welcome Dr. Julia Nikitina, Associate Professor and Research Fellow for the Center for the Post-Soviet Studies at the Moscow State University of International Relations. Moving now to Yerevan, from where we have uh, Dr. Alexandra Iskandayan, who we remember very well from the Minsk Dialogue Fora and our long-standing friend of Minsk Dialogue, Alexandra Iskandayan is the director of Caucasus Institute and from Germany, from with double affiliation of Belarusian and German, we have Dr. Sergei Bogdan, the uh, research fellow from the Friedrich Meinecke Institute of History of Freie Universität Berlin and expert council member of the Miss Dialogue Council. And uh, thank you for joining our discussion today. And without breaking our traditions, we're going to move directly to, without further ado, to Sergei's uh, speech, who has prepared an interesting analytical report. Thank you, Sergei, once again for your publication. And I'm giving the floor to you now uh, with the main uh, bullet points of your publications. I apologize for speaking first in English because I have prepared my all my notes in English. I apologize, colleagues. I see the screen. I know what is being shown. I don't. I didn't know that it was going to be shown on Facebook. I think that this is the wrong screen. I think Sergey put it on yeah. the screen. Ah. Oh, just revealing all the secrets. There will be no intrigue for sure. Now, can you stop the uh, screen sharing? That's a button at the bottom. Allow me to make a screenshot before you do that. Yeah, security is going out of the window, right? During the COVID times. We still see your screen. You have to cancel the screen sharing. Now it's, now it's good. Thank you, colleagues. So, sorry for interfering, but I think it's a matter of confidentiality. Yes, indeed. Thank you for drawing my attention to that. Now you cannot see it. No. Now everything is perfect now. Uh, so I'm grateful to uh, the Mink Dialogue and uh, Konrad uh, Adenauer Stiftung for this opportunity to discuss the theme, which much too often is discussed in too hostile or vice versa to servile framework. Our Polish uh, brothers, they have a nice uh, uh, adage which says that your viewpoint depends on your sitting point. So briefly on that, I, I have been analyzing uh, national security of one of the CSTO members, uh, Belarus, as well as security issues in its neighborhood. 
for more than 10 years and uh, had a uh, unique opportunity to regularly write on these issues for Belarus Digest and uh, Minsk Dialogue. Uh, the latter, again, supported by the Conrad in our system. Uh, the opportunity was unique because unlike many other post-Soviet projects where I worked, they never interfered with the analysis I produced. Uh, this brief outline of the CSTO situation that you have seen is influenced by this background and it mostly raises questions rather than provides definitive answers or makes a case for certain policies. Closer cooperation of post-Soviet countries in security area using this organization uh, surely could have done positive things for uh, their national security, peace, stability, and development in Eastern Europe, South Caucasus, Caucasus and Central Asia. However, we scarcely see anything of it. The nations of the former so uh, Eastern Bloc tend to achieve success in cooperating with each other only by going to Western-dominated organizations wi with all the consequences thereof. Nevertheless, we also scarcely see any real damage from the CSTO to its members. If Moscow really wanted to use the organization to control their members, uh, its members and make them support Russian policies, it would have invested much more in its NATO. And it would not allow the CSTO to so easily drift towards becoming an odd junior partner of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So why the CSTO after almost 30 years is still leading such a precarious existence? The roots of this problem are complicated, yet everything starts and ends with the organization's purpose, mission, and resulting tasks to be fulfilled. If we take more conventional threats, the CSTO members did not have and arguably do not, uh, didn't have and arguably do not have an enemy to counter. Is the NATO an enemy? Even for Russia. How much in current confrontation between Russia and the West is about ideology? And how much only about the Kremlin wishing to have a bigger slice of the global cake than now offered by the West? If we turn to other threats, like Taliban or radical armed groups in Central Asia, the CSTO has something to present, yet more theoretically, because so far never used all these capacities. Moreover, the CSTO cannot be only about Central Asia. First, this destination has little relevance to some members and uh, the members who are mostly interested in countering uh, these threats, Central Asian states, have themselves too few resources to make the CSTO focus on it as a key priority. Russia's policy towards Afghanistan and radical groups in the region is, all, is also too inconsistent. And the Kremlin after 1991 has always been too eager to give the security problems of the region a way to somebody else to solve. First the West, now China. Last but not least, the pandemic demonstrated that the organization, I mean the Collective Security Treaty Organization of course, has little to offer its members to deal with the emergencies caused by non-conventional security threats. Before talking about the aid from Moscow, let's say obvious things. Russia completely shut down its borders, ignoring the consequences for its nominal CSTO ally. Knowing the share of Russia in foreign trade of these countries, knowing how many people from those countries are working in Russia, the Kremlin definitely posed to the stability and security of some of these countries more of a threat than the Taliban, Hezbollah Tahrir or ISIS together. And it has again undermined any way minimal trust bet bef uh, between the members of the CSTO. And trust is a vital ingredient of an international cooperation. The CSTO could have helped maintain and increase that trust. So far, it didn't. I wouldn't say it failed because it never had even an opportunity to try. Спасибо большое, Сергей. Сразу небольшая техническая просьба и к Сергею, и к всем последующим спикерам. Thank you, Sergey, very much. And one technical remark for others. Please, uh, after you made a speech, switch off your microphone so that we don't get any interference. And without further ado, I'm giving the floor to Julia now. 
Julie, you have the floor. Distinguished colleagues, please tell me whether you can see my presentation. You can, good. You cannot see any other X files or secret materials from my computer, no, good. I'm happy that uh, we are together here and uh, discussing such an important subject matter. And I called my presentation in Russian, it uh, might sound a bit uh, more clear. CSTO, measuring the temperature of cooperation in the times of COVID-19. Indeed, let us look deeper now how this cooperation develops. My slides have been prepared in English to make sure that all our viewers, independent of their preferred language, can see and view different aspects. First of all, I would like to respond to the uh, short brief overview of Sergei. My first question, who indeed is the leader or who leads the CSTO, Collective Security Treaty Organization? And Sergei is absolutely right. That a lot depends on the seat that you occupy to some reason. No, it's hanging. It's, it's, I see you perfectly. No problem on my side here. Can you, can you hear me? Can you see and hear me? Dear colleagues, yes, everything is working well. Good. So I'm going to rely on a more optimistical point of view. I, I specifically put on a pink uh, jacket to view it through a rosy uh, glasses, so to say. We have a total of two interpretations of who is dominated, dominating in the CSTO. The Western overarching approach is that it is Russia which leads the organization and trying to enforce its policy through this organization. The second interpretation, as strange as it sounds, and it was also offered by Sergei, that for Russia, the CSTO doesn't play such an important role. Russia is simply trying to sell CSTO to China. Here, I would rather disagree with that point of view, but I like it anyway. It seems to be very important because in the West, indeed, many people have such a view that the CSTO is not an organization to cooperate with because Russia is the main decision maker there. But if we view it from the point of view of Belarus, that uh, Russia doesn't decide everything, then it gives us additional reason for optimism. This is the conclusion that Sir Sergei arrived at. Whether it is good or bad, I suggest to discuss it during the, our Q&A session. Next, next conclusion of Sergei about the status of observers and dialogue partners for the CIS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It was in his written report. First, potential interpretation is that no other candidates really want to cooperate with the CSTO, only CIS or SCO. But let us think now whether we can interpret it differently. And it looks to me that such an approach to cooperation between organizations fits perfectly well into the Russian concept of a big Euro Eurasian project. In the Belarusian interpretation and uh, what Lukashenko and his statement uh, about integration of integrations. This is exactly what they're talking about, integration between different organizations. So I don't see a step backwards, but rather a step forward here. Next stage, who wins? Oh, who is the ultimate beneficiary of the cooperation in, under the CSTO? First idea is that it is governments, it is protection and security for them. Why this organization was established in the first place? For the protection from the external threat and the, uh, combating the external threats. And I believe that the uh, COVID-19 is shifting the focus of our attention in terms of international security. And I suggest that during the discussion period, we think harder whether we need to think what CSTO is doing for societies, how we need to explain to societies what is in it for them. And finally, the last slide that I've prepared, 
of what is happening at the international scale and the multiple conferences on security and COVID-19 tell us that we observe the rise of nationalism and the international cooperation is developing less actively. At the same time, I believe that we need to cast a positive look, look at the next aspect. We see a, a rising role of NGOs, the role of businesses and civil society, the personal responsibility of each citizen in the fight against this common threat. And we, we know that the CSTO earlier during their peacekeeping trainings and exercises invited uh, the International Committee for Red Cross. So basically they already had this international cooperation in place and which is an important uh, destination for future development of that organization. I suggest that we think harder about that aside from nationalists, maybe we can manage to shift this focus of attention from governments to regular people whose security must be protected. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. And I would like to thank Sergey once again for this brief introductions. Before I give the floor for the response to this, this is to our two other panelists. I would like to remind people viewing us in Zoom here that, first of all, it's great if you would be more active and ask questions. I already see that we have one question. We're going to read it out for you. And those who are viewing us in Facebook, I guess that on the page of Minsk Dialogue, you can leave your questions as well. Now, the promised panelists to change our geographical Moscow. First, we'll ask uh, Dr. Alexander Skandarian from Yerevan to share his view on what has been said so far. Alexander, you have the floor. Just don't forget to switch on the microphone. It's on now. Evgeny, I'm not wearing pink uh, jacket, of course. I'm wearing a uh, rather black t-shirt, and maybe that is why. I would rather tend to disagree with the previous speakers. Or rather, I would tend to disagree with the two colleagues who spoke before me. First of all, I don't believe that in principle there is a possibility of a situation that in a security union, which includes, say, United States, Guatemala, and El Salvador and Luxembourg, we won't be able to find a, a country which has an overall leadership position. Of course we can. The CSTO is a very special union. It is, would be hard for me to find a similar, similar union in a security sector, not because it's bad or good, but simply because one of the CSTO member states is absolutely bigger than all other countries altogether in all senses of the word, in terms of the total population, uh, overall area, economics, it's a permanent member of the security a council, a permanent member, and it is, uh, it is a member of everything else. If we try to switch off the legal realities and go into political realities, that uh, they're not going to, uh, it's hard for me to believe that they're not going to uh, sit in the driving seat of this organization. If, even if they sit on the top of a hill, like Mr. Putin is sitting on the top of a hill and thinking of how to be less significant than Kyrgyzstan or Armenia, then still it won't be, he won't be able to do so. It's an objective reality, that's it. Secondly, what CSTO is all about and why we keep discussing it, its role. I think the CSTO, I would use the following metaphor, is like a will without a rim. There is a center, I don't know what it's called, the center from which the spokes are coming, the hub of the will, and the hub is Moscow and the spokes go to Minsk, Yerevan, Astana, and Bishkek. There is nothing uniting these spokes, no rim, and no 
serious interests, shared interests and security between Armenia and Kyrgyzstan. That's a fact. Whatever unites these countries is Russia. Again, it's an objective reality for Russia. CSTO is a form of interaction in the field of security with post-Soviet states. It's a compact form of CIS, uh, which is focused on security issues for each of those countries. This is a form of loyalty to Russia, again, in the field of security. All of us, I'm talking about the member states of CSTO, all of us uh, have different problems. We don't have shared problems or threats for Armenia, CSTO, is a format of cooperation in the field of security to procurement of weapons, uh, training of military personnel in the case of conflict with Azerbaijan, which is still unregulated. And in that re regard, it is important for us. For Belarus, it's a framework of sorts to cooperate with Russia, in fact, in, through other sectors aside from security. And in that regard, that's why they value the CSTO as an organization. For Kyrgyzstan, there's a serious threat because they know which countries they border on. Tajikistan too, for Kazakhstan, China, and other problems, Kyrgyzstan, there are other problems, and so on and so forth. So in that regard, to expect from the CSTO that it will turn into NATO would be too foolhardy. Of course, NATO also has an a ruling member, it is true, but they have three uh, nuclear states and not one. And size-wise, uh, based on all the parameters that I mentioned previously, Germany, France, I know UK, Italy, Turkey cannot be compared to the lack of balance that we have in the CSTO. So in that regard, it's quite objective. It's my first idea that I wanted to say. I will try to be briefer with the second one. Second idea, I do not take uh, too seriously the prospects of uh, SCO, the Shanghai Organization for Security, Security Organization. Uh, so I don't think that uh, you can take seriously any structures that uh, were China and India, or India and Pakistan are co-members. I have a very specific view on that. And uh, when we look at SCO, how it was created as a compact organization, what had a clear idea, China and Russia had to look on what happened with Central Asia economy and security. Ever since then, when it started to change, SCO started to permute it into something when, be it SCO, CSTO or Mercosur, anything can be member of SCO now. And the last thing, what will happen to what will happen to coronavirus? So, what will happen in post-COVID period? I agree with uh, previous speakers, in particular with Julia, to a less extent with uh, Sergey. Coronavirus does not give give birth to problems; it catalyzes them. Uh, these are the problems of isolationism problems of uh, relying on own interests and national egoism. In case of as CSTO, they were not born with the coronavirus. We're talking to the person sitting in Belarus. What problems uh, related to CSTO are happening every, what, six months and keep following us? You don't need to tell anybody about this and both CSTO and Coronavirus is not a reason for it. Of course, maybe COVID-19 has um, highlighted those problems that had existed in the past, exist at the moment, and will exist in the future. And they root and derive from the structure of CSTO, not the, because of the COVID-19. What will happen in the post-COVID period? That's the last thing that I wanted to say, and I agree with Julie on that. There will be securitization of the healthcare sector. In Armenia now, the main minister, who was quite a poor person, was, he became the minister after revolution without knowing who, what he is enrolling with. Now he is taking care of security and everything else, all the responsibility and so on. 
this is only one of the indicators that we are starting to approach a situation when facing the challenge that all of us, the whole world is facing, will lead to some shifts that will turn us into yet another paradigm struggle. Before that, we were fighting who is more economically successful, who is more democratically successful, who is more Western oriented. Now we are also fighting with coronavirus, looking who is more successful with that. That will be yet another um, matter of contention and doctors and epidemiologists, biologists, microbiologists, I don't know, will be yet another group of people who will dictate things to us. And the very last thing, you remember after the terrorist act in the United States with the airplanes, people started to agree with the fact that the security experts, terrorist experts started to dictate rules to them. And uh, many cure scissors were confiscated when uh, uh, young fragile women were entering airplanes so that they don't, don't use them as, as weapons. But airplanes are flying all, all the time. I know about scissors. Uh, you cannot uh, bring in Coca-Cola. You are allowed only to buy it uh, on the grounds of airport. But generally speaking, the fact that we entrusted the security specialists some part of our freedom in return to our security, something similar will happen to the healthcare sector. And the world is not going to turn around. And the trends of CSTO will remain the same. S slow dissimulation, slow isolationism, slow putting a stake on one's own interests. That's how it was originally designed. Sorry for speaking for too long. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And now with great joy, I would like to give the floor to Professor Danilov. Thank you very much. And thank you for this very interesting project. Perhaps I will respond to what has been said before by our respected experts, because I believe that some of the ideas mentioned to them are close to what I wanted to say. I believe that now we see the advent of understanding that, generally speaking, the problems of response to the COVID-19, to this infection and the crisis are not boiling down to the immediate reaction. We're talking about the post-COVID life, that the biggest risks, including the security risks, are shifting to another side. And I agree with Julia Nikitin on that uh, they are related to a certain extent to a social economic state and the relations within the society and integration institution, institutes and how uh, the society accepts the usefulness of this integration institutions also under the changing circumstances and so on and so forth. And uh, it relates to many other problems that will continue to exist and we need to make it clear they include the problems of financial uh, support for international organizations like the CSTO. If we have a program, we need to look under the current crisis circumstances. This uh, United Nations agenda, whether it is in line with the changing realities, if not so, should we correct their agenda? If the answer is yes, then how are we going to fund the new agenda? This is an important challenge that CSTO is facing. And uh, so far we have an answer no to that. We looked at the May session of that organization and largely speaking, we're not talking about a new agenda. They were, we are talking that bureaucratically CSTO is um, tried to fit the, uh, itself into the new agenda. They made some declaration in support of UN. Uh, they attempted or rather continued the agenda related to the celebration of the 75th vic uh, anniversary of Victory Day and whatever was declared under the Russian chairmanship. 
So this is the first thesis. We need to look broader. We need to discuss the future agendas of CSTO, considering what has happened and uh, depending on how scenario-wise the situation will change in the security arena. The second bullet point is quite self-evident. This is multilateral approach and the collective responses. I liked very much the picture painted by uh, Dr. Iskandarian about the will without the rim. Yes, indeed it is so, and uh, it looks very much like what is happening in reality. So the collective part is really lacking in the CSTO. So if you will, it, CSTO is a matrix of national interests, which gradually are changing, but there is no collective beginning or root of this organization. If we speak about conceptual uh, or collective policy, if we're talking about collective response, this is what uh, CSTO is solely missing. I believe that there are certain arguments and motivation for that, and uh, Dr. Alexander Iskandrian spoke about this, and uh, the provided brief paper also spoke about the limitation of the collective usefulness or actions of organizations. But for organization to exist, of course it is needed, we shouldn't neglect this problem, but rather address it. And here, the COVID-19 provides a unique opportunity for such a dialogue. But for that, the initiative must be taken by somebody. Russia, as a leader of this organization, should do that. Whether Russia is prepared to initiate targeted discussion of joint shared agenda under the circumstances of COVID-19, which is important not only in terms of the future of organization, but also in terms of the image of this organization and in how this organization is capable or incapable because of different reasons to respond to the crises which are an important strike against the interests of the CSTO member states. So I'm talking about their national interests and interests related to the organization itself. An example of that would be uh, an example from the past, the earthquake in Spitak. Remember within which time the aid was organized, how it was happening. Now, nowadays, God forbid something similar happens. Do we have collective security structures who will be capable of organizing similar response to such a disaster? This is a question that uh, should be addressed to the CSTO also. Another bullet point, we need to have a targeted discussion of a possible shared agenda and coordinate the actions of this organization in the context of a prioritized uh, addressing of the mutually important interests. It is quite clear that uh, member states of CSTO are in a totally different uh, circumstance and conditions, be it economic or financial, and risks for weaker members uh, much greater than the risks for, say, the leaders, Russia. And under these circumstances, do you think we are prepared to ensure or respond to these risks without which, uh, based on the collective actions, or here again will uh, rely on the national egoism and the organization as such will find itself in a rather marginal situation in the context of implementation by member states of their own national interests of security. 
Next, we could have, well, considered if, for instance, we still decide that the CSTO activities must be grounded on something, some stronger conceptual and strategical, strategic and operational basis, then under similar circumstances, under, under such circumstances, In what way each member state of the CSTO is prepared for such movement toward what I call collective security? For that, we need to again initiate very serious and honest dialogue among the member states. Why NATO, for instance, when they're reconsidering the issue of their strategic planning, NATO appoints another a uh, group of wise men, five plus five, and they're going to look what to do in the post-COVID world, how to change the NATO strategy in the post-COVID period, how to change the agendas, what resources they have, what they're lacking. Do we have such a group of wise men in the CSTO? Maybe it makes sense to think about that. But, again, if we view it from this angle, then we need to do something with the high level of bureaucratization of the CSTO activities. We need somehow to increase the democratization of that organization, if you will, to see whether everybody agrees to uh, uh, use the parliamentary dimension here as well. I suggest that we consider the well-known deficiencies of CSTO not as uh, ribbons on the uh, funeral wreath, but rather the absolute necessity that needs to be addressed and put together. And for that, we need to address the serious issues. They include first the changes, changing of the situation under the current uh, crisis period provides such an opportunity. But whether this opportunity is going to be grabbed and used, first of all, by Russia, whether Russia is prepared to walk this path is still not clear. And in conclusion about SCO, this scenario idea to sell or give away CSTO, conditionally speaking, to SCO is possible. But to, because of many reasons, everybody understands that, first of all, we're talking about dissimilarities in, of uh, or total different membership in these two organizations. First of all, I'm talking about uh, China, and it's quite clear that the agendas of these two organizations are not the same and the transmission of the military political agenda to SCO is unlikely possible because of many reasons. And then I think that, in fact, the political value of each one of these organizations of SCO and uh, CSTO for these two organizations is obvious for some members, but again, there's no coincidence between them. And to somehow merge these two organizations, conditionally speaking, harmonize these two organizations would be very difficult because such an enhancement or enlargement of multilateralism will complicate the quite complicated relations between the organizations. Thank you very much. We have heard a lot of interesting ideas that we need to discuss here, but I believe that in the very beginning, once again, we'll return back to the immediate challenges. What exactly can or should this organization do to uh, respond 
to the pandemic threats. We'll do this because we have received two questions already from Tatiana Chulitska, who is addressing Julia, asking her to explain how CSTO can be useful to the societies, member states of the member states in the situation of post-COVID. So this is the question for Julia. And right away, one of our speakers, Mr. Uh, Ahmed Usupov, is asking this question in a broader concept. What can be done now under the con uh, umbrella of CSTO and SCO to fight back COVID? So it's uh, quite a broad question. We can answer it quickly or suggest different ideas. But as long as uh, Julie is addressed first, we'll ask Julia to answer. The way I remember, on the SCO, they were discussing a possibility so that the healthcare system start to be harmonized with each other or cooperate with each other. There was an idea to create something like a Shanghai healthcare organization, something like that. It was like five, seven years ago, such an idea discussed, and then this idea was not really popular, but it was done on the wave of all the previous avian flus and uh, wine flus, and possibly the time has come to revisit this possibility once again. As for the activities of uh, the CSTO, it's quite a difficult question because CS, for CSTO, healthcare is not a core issue, but Dr. Iskandarian remembered quite, recalled securitization very well. Those were not initially under the umbrella of the security arena and uh, in a military and political context. Maybe with it, in the same vein, we could have organized a conference uh, called uh, CSTO in the period of uh, final exams in school. Again, this is a con context that one way or another all CSTO member states are involved. All of them are parents of their children, they take care of their children. And this is a kind of framework that exists around us and which adds new problems to us. But whether CSTO should be the organization to solve those problems, I don't know. Maybe still it is one of the methods to demonstrate to the society that the CSTO can be a useful organization. And uh, Professor Daniel was absolutely right when he mentioned the earthquake as an example, the possibility to act for the CSTO under the uh, humanitarian emergencies or um, environmental disasters. This is something that uh, can be very close and uh, resonate with the hearts of the society. There are collective forces who can deliver aid or personal protection means to some remote areas who can organize uh, field hospitals. This is what will resonate in the hearts of people and will be more visible. But here, we need to have a decision at a high level, whether the CSTO is prepared to move along this path of development or whether we're just observing a bureaucratic adaptation to the current conditions. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, indeed. The first reaction that must appear with this, why CSTO should do something which is not its core issue. Uh, but then we can look at other organizations like the NATO, everybody one way or another are showing some activity about that. Also not to be sidelined uh, by this process and to demonstrate their relevancy somehow. In further development of this question, we have received yet another question from uh, Rima Abdulina, who is listening to us and asking, considering that Russia, he's saying that Russia is ahead of everybody in terms of the number of infected people, even without going to stylistic nuances, still having a lot of um, uh, infected people, in what way other CSTO member states could help Russia? So here we're talking about yet another level of this question, in what way Russia would be prepared under the current circumstances to accept this aid and why Russia would need CSTO with these functions. Could anybody, dear colleagues, to answer this question, uh, either in response to the previous questions or the question that I've just voiced? I can try to answer this very briefly. 
by turning the answer to this question around. Let's see the pandemic now for the military organizations like uh, NATO and CSTO is not only a situation related to health risk, but also it is a situation which increases their agenda on how to counteract different military risks in future. Also, among other things from the international organizations. In, in, in case of conflicts in future, whether some military responses are required or not. I believe that, objectively speaking, the military and political organization must handle such issues as well. If we do handle them, then it's clear that some medical and biological responses to potential pandemic will be shifted to military medicine, first of all. Part of it is working in a confidential mode, and that is why maybe it's even easier for them to do it in a, for military and political organizations. By viewing it from this angle, it becomes clear that the potential of cooperation in the military and po political field cannot limit itself only to the military and operational fields of action. Here, much more significant and useful and relevant would be the CSTO if they expand their military and medical cooperation. And this way they will increase their relevance and usefulness. Thank you very much. Alexander, please. Speaking about the as aid uh, provided on the CSTO and the SCO. As far as I know, I might be wrong, of course. It's simply, it's not provided, uh, such aid is provided, but it's not declared as provided under CSTO and SCO. At least what I know about my country, Armenia, we have doctors from Russia who have come to assist us from France and China. Also, there was assistance by not doctors, but some medical aid. Armenia provided assistance also to China when the, uh, there was a, it was a hotbed of COVID-19. Uh, speaking about CSTO, of course, CSTO must handle this because it's a, not a matter of some health control or infection control, but uh, there's a uh, general security problem. Speaking about other countries, how they can help Russia. Again, differently, let's suggest that my country, for instance, had quite a number of Russian citizens who stuck in Armenia because of COVID. They had to be treated if they contracted COVID. They had to be transported, considering that Georgia fully shut down uh, their land borders on both sides. Russia, also did supplies from Armenia, quite a difficult task. And it had to be coordinated. It had to be coordinated with Georgia, with whom Russia has no diplomatic relations, and so on. And we'll always find ways to help each other, and it must be found. And. Uh, People must found, find practical reasons to do it, but it's simply not declared to be done under CSTO or SCO, but simply under bilateral relations. And now about the metaphor of a colleague from Moscow, thank you very much for that, about the SPITAC um, earthquake. See, now it's the same thing is happening. SPITAC earthquake just happened in one country then, and most of the people who came here and financial aid allocated was the national budget. Now, again, if something happens in Armenia, uh, people will come from Yerevan and the national budget will provide some assistance from the central budget. But those people who were coming from abroad, uh, from beyond the borders of uh, Soviet Union during the Spitak earthquake, of course, we are grateful to them, still to them. But those people 
can be seen now nowadays from other countries, from a person from Lithuania. We had a team of doctors from Lithuania. So still, there is a national level and a supranational level. That's how it was during the Spitak uh, earthquake or during Chernobyl. I, I'm not saying where it was organized better or worse, but it was done in this way because it was one single country. Within itself, a country works continues to work like that. Like it was in Irkutsk, for instance, a problem pops up. Maybe one can expect uh, that somebody from Smolensk will come there quickly. But as far as the supranational level is concerned, it's not built very well. It's not institution institutionalized well. Sometimes it's um, slipshot as well, but it's a supranational problem. Thank you. Evgeny, can I add a couple of comments in response to that? Alexandra, I, I enjoy remembering our meetings in Yerevan, although we are discussing not directly, but I enjoy discussing these things. We speak the same language here, but when I sp spoke about the capability of an organization to act when I compared these disasters and emergencies, my question was uh, focused on different thing. That is whether CSTO is capable as an organization, whether they have an inherent mechanism, whether the CSTO can, can as an organization react quickly. Uh, aside from many other things, I also handle the problems uh, with NATO and I looked at how it was done there. They use mechanisms which have already existed before, like the coordination center, the uh, aerial communication center that uh, allowed them to plan all the logistics and move uh, the required cargoes and organize the air routes for the transportation. They have these mechanisms in place. My question was whether CSTO as an organization capable to do that, whether they have such mechanisms. If they don't have them, uh, whether they need to establish them, I think yes. I fully agree with you. I have no doubts with that. I am prepared to subscribe to everything you said. Thank you very much. Now I suggest that we go above with our discussion and dis now discuss some strategic issues. And Julia is telling me that she has something to react to the idea voiced by uh, Professor Danilov about the group of wise men. I would also like to touch upon that. We see that the newly established group of wise men under NATO, which was put together actually before pandemic uh, based on the results of the previous summit, and now they're going to adopt their uh, operations to the pandemic. It's not, no, by no way is a new group, although there are historical parallels between the tasks of this group and what happened, if you remember in the 1960s and 1970s, when big issues were handled then. But what is interesting, a few weeks ago, we were organizing a similar discussion on NATO on the ex-Deputy uh, 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 Secretary General of NATO said that uh, the chief institutional force of NATO is that the organization always was flexible to adopt themselves to a new reality in the securities that happened in the international relations. And chiefly they were doing this because all the member states found uh, this cementing common value basis that uh, glued uh, them together. But we're talking about the CSTO now. And uh, during our discussion, it, a different metaphor was used a number of times uh, from uh, Alexandra Iskandayan about the a wheel with a hub and the spokes, but without a rim. And here, quite naturally, we have another question rising. What this group of wise men can discuss then? NATO is discussing how to adopt themselves to new realities. And the CSTO, if this uh, will of the hub and spokes without rim, where everybody is looking for some, something that they need and they get something that they need, despite the fact that uh, they're not sharing all these needs, uh, it's in principle a totally different reality. What the group of wise men should discuss for the CSTO, what kind of mandate can be given to them, what kind of mission that they should be assigned. This is what Julia, that, that was your initiative. I believe that we're already uh, creating a group of wise men here discussing this, but it's just a lyrical side note for all. I believe that here we could have used such a metaphor again of simile, quite popular it is now to ask a question because everybody's sitting home, we still need to work, 
And the question is where to find inspiration to write an article, to invent something new. And the answer to this is quite simple. One should look for inspiration. One needs to sit down and start working and then you'll uh, get inspired out of its own accord. The same way it works with the cooperation with SIT and uh, start thinking that we're lacking something to have effective cooperation, then in principle, the wish to cooperate is not going to be born out of thin air. Here, I think more importantly, we need to have a general concept that we believe that this uh, cooperation potentially can bring some benefit to us. Let us start cooperating. And then in the process, in the course of cooperation, we'll understand what this benefit might be. And uh, here, if we take the European series of integration, there is such an approach as new functionalism. And uh, the idea of it is that you start cooperating in one field and gradually you start creating institutions and uh, it is quite convenient for you to move this cooperation to a different ground, what Evgeny said. We can call it adapt adaptability, adaptability or the spillover effect, if you will. To a certain extent, we can consider that we are already observing this spillover effect, like there are some structures like the crisis response center of the CSTO, which has been in existence for, uh, or rather it was developed for quite a number of years, then it was inaugurated and in May, Mr. Lavrov suggested to use it for coordination of activities in response to coronavirus. So such structures are in place and can be used. As for the group of wise men, I believe that we need to have uh, some formality. We need to sit down together and decide that we need to cooperate. Let us look on what issues we can generate more benefits, not because there is some kind of instruction from on high, just because we think that would be the right thing to do. And for that, we need to involve and engage the society, businesses, and so on. Similar discussions can be applied to the Eurasian integration under the Eurasian Union because the Eurasian Economic Mission was developing different development plans until 2025 and they were searching for new destinations which could have been offered to all participants. Let us cooperate say here and there which is good but it doesn't work always. I believe it would make more sense to combine a bottom up and a top down approach. See what is the need of a military industrial complex? What are the needs of military uh, doctors? What are the needs of specialized education or some other structures? But that would require that supranational coordination and the willingness and the use, getting used to such cooperation in the Union State of Russia and Belarus, the mechanisms are so numerous and many officials don't even know about their existence because some uh, documents have been signed. It's a daily, uh, a daily convention of or getting used to cooperation. Let us say that it's not only uh, cooperate on the CST because it is going to be good for our collective security. Here we need to change approaches and as always I'm wearing an uh, optimist's jacket today. I'm sure that uh, there will be some people who disagree with me. Before we develop it further I will in a couple of words repeat the question for Sergei Bogdan because I saw that he had some technical problems. Now we're discussing Sergei based on the idea originally voiced by Professor Danilov, whether it would be great to a uh, group of wise men on the CSTO, what kind of mandate or whether agenda can be assigned such a group of wise men. And while Sergei is thinking about it, maybe I will ask Alexander Iskandarian to continue your consideration about this. Again, grounded on the well-known thesis that not functionalism and the spillover effect, these are all good things, but rather uh, normative wishes. Nobody's saying that we shouldn't think in that vein, but now 
and more fashionable is realism. And in that respect, how relevant would be such an idea that it would make sense to rely on such a uh, task setting and then everything else will uh, be given rise out of this. Alexander, you have the floor. Thank you, Yipkini. I believe that hypothetically such group of wise men has a job cut out for them. Moreover, I believe that philosophically it's quite clear what they should do. Of course, they shouldn't attempt to turn CSTO into NATO. It is simply impossible. It's objectively impossible, not that it is good or bad, uh, that those people are bad or these people are good. No, it's uh, under no circumstances it would be possible. Secondly, to develop a shared collective agenda again would be a, a mission impossible to make such that uh, Tajikistan and uh, Belarus has shared problems or threats would be simply impossible. We need to accept this reality. The reality is such as it is. In Armenia, I make public speeches on cooperation between Armenia, for instance, with Russia. Usually, I speak just like this. I have no other Russia to offer to you. That's what I'm saying. This is what it is. Um, whether you like it or not, this is what it is. This is the country you have to cooperate with. Judging from what is happening in the Russian-Belarusian relations, there is no Belarus for Russia either. Judging from what happened to Mr. Zeiss and his appointment, there will be no Armenia to Russia and Belarus either. So this reality must be formulated. What wise people do? How do they formulate things? They, this reality must be, be attempted to unite it. It must be united uh, here and Yerevan, for instance, people not only from academic circles, they understand that they don't really understand what is done in Central Asia or Belarus. There is no single intellectual field. There is no single this discourse field. There is no single language for description of all of this. And the size of the country is less important here to uh, use the same language for description of realities. When and where, if it will be done, when the reality is recognized, what will people be doing in Armenia? Armenians will coordinate their interests that we have here in cooperation with Russia with other members of the CSTO, because this interests uh, in Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan will be different. And first of all, you need to be aware of them. And then you need to coordinate your interests with them so that they don't uh, interfere with your interests, which happened in the past. So we need to do that. And uh, what next thing we need to do? We need to try to understand this inconsistent interests in each particular case and manifestation. Sometimes small countries of the CSTO act as uh, consumers or as consumerists. And they need to understand that in integration costs and it costs uh, efforts and some organizational work. If you want, or if you're keen on integration, if you're an isolationist, if you're saying uh, it's enough to feed other people, then it's a totally different uh, discourse. But if you work under these rules, then yes, it costs. And uh, you need to be prepared to pay for the problems that Kyrgyzstan uh, has. And for Armenia, it will be harder to swallow, of course, and so on and so forth, to create a single field for discourse, single uh, set of definitions, single language that we can use. Based on that, we can move towards not even understanding of shared problems, but rather combination of private or individual interests, because the CSTO can be, you know, like um, a table for discussion. A table where people are not throwing uh, glasses at each other, but trying to constructively solve problems. So in that respect, CSTO is no NATO. But NATO also has a similar thing. NATO also has among its members, say, Greece and Turkey. And there are problems related to these two countries that is quite 
self-evident. So that's how it works. Of course, NATO, again, is totally different to, to develop, and I fully agree with Dmitry, we need to develop the new paradigm, which is simply lacking or non-existent at the moment. When a new crisis uh, popped up, it turned out that NATO does have some instruments, but CSEO doesn't have them. Tomorrow, a different instrument might happen. We should, shouldn't think about coronavirus here. COVID-19 is like uh, totally came out of the thin air. Nobody was expecting it. Everybody encountered the same problem. Tomorrow, uh, it might be a totally different nature of crisis. It would, won't be doctors, but say musicians or something else. But the mechanism of uniting, combining the interests of those new people should be prepared uh, beforehand and not done ad hoc, because if you do it ad hoc, usually the end result is no good. Thank you very much. Now I'll ask Sergey Bogdan to comment on this, because we haven't heard anything from you, Sergey. You were switched off because of technical reasons. Yes, I'm sorry for the technical problems. I understand that the question was, first of all, about the establishment of the group of wise men, if I understand you correctly. Yes, exactly. What kind of assignment can be, could we prepare or mandate can we give to this group of wise men? What realistically could they come up with which could have changed the situation with the CSTO for the better? I wouldn't want to act as a total antipod to Julia, and I would like to sound more optimistic because unlike Alexander, I still think that we need such a long story of existence of all those post-Soviet states under single political institution starting from the Russian Empire still creates certain prerequisites for cooperation. Secondly, there is such thing when in fact all of us tend to forget that they typologically if we look at this with all the similarities of those states under the CSTO, under other Eurasian unions. Still, there are a lot of shared things. This is the periphery which attempted to become a center and they uh, are continuing to be a semi-periphery. These are the states who are trying to find their role in the newly shaped world and uh, they share a lot of values in this search. So I believe some things shared interests can be found uh, for Belarus and Kyrgyzstan, aside from finding problem of what to do with Bakir. Still, going back to the original question, I believe the original idea to create new organs, new mechanisms, unfortunately, they're doomed to failure. Why? Because when we shall attempt to create, conditionally speaking, an intercontinental ballistic missile, then we need to learn not the algebra, but say arith arithmetic. And um, therein lies a lot of problems in the CSTO. It seems like Sergei is offline now. Sergei, we cannot hear you. Something prevents us from continuing this dialogue from with Berlin. We're going to wait for the next connection from Sergei, and I'm addressing the same question to Dmitry now, who originally voiced it. I'm not saying that such a group had, needs to be created or established or put together. What I'm saying is that for the CSTO to increase its efficiency as an organization, they need to strengthen the collective values if they put such a question at the political level, if they were discussing the establishment of some new strategic orientation or strengthening of collective roots, then in that case, we would be talking about the need for some group of wise men. We would be then thinking what potentially could have been done in that regard. A good simple example for that. collective peacekeeping forces of the CSTO. Do we need them or not? If we need them, then where and how can they be applied? What kind of mandate will they have? 
whether they need to develop anything jointly like that. Elementary questions are such, and uh, they're in the agenda objectively, but to some reason, no, they are not formulated. The two answers to this question. First, nobody is, finds it interesting uh, uh, under the structure which exists at the moment. That is why the organization uh, finds uh, sufficient the toolkit that they have. Second answer is that they're lacking the joint initiative, but um, somebody must take on this initiative. If we're saying that Russia is a leader, let Russia to voice this initiative, if again it is within the scope of interests of Russia. Under these circumstances, if a critical task is set, if we're discussing a joint shared collective agenda, and if we're seriously considering joint actions targeting the re end result, if it, it is based on the program, and the program in turn is based on resources, if then members will have to report on different dimensions of the operations of the organizations, different conferences. Only in that regard, only in this algorithm, can we be talking about the high level group of wise men who would be reporting directly to the initiators. And anybody could be an initiator. It could be not only Russia, it could be a collective council, for instance. So I believe this is, what makes sense and to say that some people will get together and start thinking how to sell their beautiful ideas to the administration headed by Russia and other members of the CSTO would be too foolhardy. Thank you and Sergey you're back online. I understand that you haven't uh, said everything you wanted to say let us complete that. Yes I'm sorry I didn't understand it. Uh, my speech was suspended. I, what I wanted to say is that the problem lies in the fact that before we move to smaller, more detailed levels of cooperation, we need to solve the basic aspects of, in this dimension. I'm talking about the dimension of military political cooperation. And here, what uh, Professor Danilov said, he spoke about the collective, uh, say, peacekeeping forces, whether we need them or not. Of course, we can uh, descend even to a one step down, even the supply of arms within the CSTO. They remain to be a problem of huge concern. Even one case when Belarus received last year, started to receive new uh, airplane fighters from Russia is an outrageous thing because I understand that uh, they received it at a deduct deductive price and everything, although we don't know the actual details. But the fact remains such that, for instance, Malaysia, Russia was prepared to sell uh, uh, fighters to Malaysia for palm oil and to Belarus only for real cash. Uh, only after advance payment of this cash. They could never uh, sell those fighters even on a loan. So what kind of COVID are we discussing here? There is no resolution of even such a basic question of how to supply countries with arms. One of the key members of the association, of the organization, I don't want to brag here, but the sky over Moscow is partially protected by the uh, air defense from Belarus, I'm not going to mention other factors before handling COVID and other uh, more detailed aspects. CSTO would make sense to uh, solve problems of uh, mutual shootings in Central Asia, who are all members of the CSTO. It would also be a perfect thing to start to create a reputation for the organization as something positive. And the last thing, why it's happening, I can say that I don't see any more interesting future for the CSTO while Russia is governed by the people who are ruling this country now. I'm not talking about democracy and rule of law. I'm talking about democracy and uh, allies spirit. I understand that Vladimir Putin, it is for a reason that when he spoke for a number of times, when he uh, 
uh, referenced the quote of Alexander III, Emperor Alexander III, that Russia has no allies, that during the Great, Patri that the Great Patriotic War could be won without Ukrainians and others. What I'm saying here is that in principle so far, while Russia is ruled by people who see as allies only maybe some potentially some Western countries, but in no way somebody smaller or closer to them, then CSTO will continue to exist as a phantom organization like nowadays. So in the very end, Sergei turned the discussion uh, into a more acute form. That's when we should have continued it, but uh, we have very little time left. I had two more questions to ask, but based on, because of the lack of time, I'm going to merge these two questions together. Let us try in our last round of discussion to look 10 years ahead for the CSTO. It's clear that we spoke about it one way or another already, that its prospects of the future will rather depend on what we'll do with that. That's why we need a discussion in the group of wise men. But I'm even talking about, about these prospects in the context that inevitably, what inevitably will happen in the relation, international relations in the next five, 10 years. I believe that everybody will agree that the key line of confrontation already uh, will continue in the next few years and there will be growing confrontation between uh, China and the United States. So under this context, what will be the place or rule or scope for maneuver for the CSTO? Well, uh, it's an obviously easy question. That's what Sergey spoke about this. An easy quite answer to this will be the CSTO is coming closer to the uh, SEO that maybe we could be talking about the movement to one of the sides of this confrontation, but in what way it would be a, a uh, justified way to say, because the uh, strategic autonomy of Russia, for instance, in this confrontation is also quite grounded. So it, to summarize my quite long question, what do you think in the next 10 years, what will be CSTO like under the conditions of the growing confrontation between the United States and China? And I suggest that we now move in the same order as we started our discussion. That's why, Sergey, hopefully this time you won't switch off from us. Yes, I'm sorry for the quality of connection. Unfortunately, this is what I have. Speaking about the next 10 year future prospects, we shouldn't try to overestimate the readiness of the Russian uh, government to confront the West because Russia uh, is key more on uh, being more balanced or sitting on the fence between uh, West and East, China and the West, uh, without taking anybody's side. But objectively speaking, those people who are sitting in the Kremlin now, they don't have such a uh, thing or notion as the ally in their head. It is totally hopeless. It, it is possible only when the new generation of government comes to Russia, it will objectively come, of course, because Vladimir Putin is not eternal, just like all of us. Speaking in principle, what will happen then the scenario of uh, SEO expansion and the mar subsequent marginalization of CSTO, I see no real future under this scenario for the CSTO in the format for Belarus, for instance, and Armenia, I'm sorry, but for the Central Asia, of course, it would make more sense to work with Beijing. Thank you very much, Julia, please. Yes, here, I cannot agree here at all because uh, my role is to voice an alternative viewpoint. My view on the matter is that the CSTO, institutionally, bureaucratically, is evolving with about the same velocity as the whole Eurasian space evolves. And here we can use an example with the General Secretary General, for instance, Nikolai Bardyuzha, ensures stability and efficient cooperation. Then the decision was made to uh, change the chairmanship. And herein comes the crisis with the movement of ruling power, not only in Armenia, it is true about any other post Soviet countries. The change happens and they start to question the 
efficiency and success of previous regimes, uh, then the situation resolves with the Secretary General. Indeed, Evgeny is right, then based on the Eurasian context, a CSTO cannot tear itself away from the Eurasian context and develop autonomously from it. And I believe that the internal context uh, impacts the development of the CSTO greater than the external context. When, um, we, uh, when it was suggested to look at the China-United uh, States confrontation, I'd rather suggest we look at the internal confrontation in the internal elites. If we take the regional context here, then I see two uh, contexts for the development. First, in terms of the, uh, from the standpoint of Russia, remains to be important the large uh, Eurasian European partnership and uh, cooperation between the regional organizations. In that regard, Russia finds it more beneficial to have CSTO separately, SCO separately, and Eurasian Union separately. And the second idea is about the peacekeeping operations. I believe that uh, in about 10 years time, CSTO will graduate to start cooperating with the United Nations, not only on paper, but also in practical terms. And pot potentially they might take part in different operations beyond the uh, zone of operation of the CSTO. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Alexander? I wouldn't individualize so much the politics, even geopolitics, and uh, put it in dependence of advent or leave of some people. Mr. Putin is not a cause, he is a result of what is happening in the Russian Federation difference between uh, Yeltsin and Putin is the difference between presidents with uh, low uh, energy prices and high energy prices. That's it. And whatever will happen next will depend and depend on that. Otherwise, the whole uh, human history will turn into a set of ex accidents because uh, somebody uh, elects a bad person in uh, Netherlands and it changes into Bangladesh or the other way around. Whether Russia will continue in the post-Soviet zone, continue to create some integration projects with Putin, without Putin, doesn't matter. Simply size-wise, and it will largely depend on the size and the role it will play. To go beyond the regions, if we call it the region, of course, and this, the CIS without Baltic states, if we took at the regional projects, of course, the main Access would be the Chinese uh, American confrontation that Evgeny spoke about, and to consider that Armenia will choose one or another side. I'm um, sorry, not Armenia. Russia will choose one or another side would be too difficult for me because both uh, choices would be too precarious for it. They will continue to uh, try to exist between them. The SCO will continue to exist. It will mar be marginalized just like CIS and just as CSTO. But functionally, it's already a uh, stillborn child because what, uh, the, the fact, what if you have uh, China, Pakistan, and India uh, among co-members, it cannot exist effectively, according to me. I don't think that CSTO can expand further. In the worst case scenario, they will remain to be the same in size or they can even shrink. Speaking about Central Asia, it's more or less clear how it's going to happen. They have Afghanistan on one side, China on the, uh, on the other. They will have the same motivation to be members of the CSTO. In case of Armenia, a lot depends on the developing and incompleted Azerbaijan conflict. Uh, I'm talking about Armenians uh, in a broader sense. In 10 years' time, I'm, I'm afraid that it won't be solved, this Azeri-Armenian conflict. So that's why the need for uh, the CSTO and the security will remain. 
for Belarus, it largely depends on this on the fate of the person who is not uh, again eternal, but a different person. All of us are people. Again, it's not a matter of the person itself, but rather the geographical place that uh, Belarus occupies. With Belarus, in theory, everything can change. Whether it will happen in 10 years or 20 years, I don't know. It depends on many factors. But in principle, we can imagine some kind of choice that will be taken. The fact that CSTO will change into a highly institutionalized organization, highly capable to do joint actions or peaceful operations, in theory, it can be done. But what will happen in reality, that uh, in reality, Kyrgyz soldiers together with Belarusian ones will be about, uh, standing on the border of uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, it's highly unlikely. And the national egoism will continue to be an uh, overarching motivation and no matter what different wise men are saying, but wise men are one thing, but politicians are totally another. In real politics, they will recognize an acute need to strongly, uh, I don't think that the politicians will find it necessary to strengthen the cooperation between member states of CSTO. I tried not to use the word post-Soviet zone. I already think that at the moment, between, I don't know, Tajikistan and Egypt, or Armenia and Jew, uh, Greece, there is more shared things than between Armenia and Tajikistan. Between Tajik, uh, Turkmenistan and Korea, there are more shared things than between Armenia and Argentina. That's why to say that there are things that, share, that we share, of course, some, it's our common past, some sentiments, some language situation, because most people speak Russian in our countries. I believe that, and I've seen how my students, I was in Georgia, and uh, it will continue to happen. We cannot uh, do without it, and to consider a post-Soviet zone uh, uh, as a common area because we were in the same empire. When I was born, of course I'm an old person, but I'm not as old as Tutankhamon. When I was born, Hong Kong and Rhodesia, were part of the same empire, then what? So I don't think that this space is going to develop under the same rules. There's acute needs for Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan, and they're all different, and Russia too. And, uh, and all of this is going to continue to exist, but with lack of coordination. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexander. And uh, Dmitry, you have the floor next. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the participants for your very interesting views. Naturally, that final question doesn't have an answer the way I see it. The form is quite easy here. It has been offered in the past. It's hard to forecast what will happen, what the future will bring. We understand how quickly the situation can change momentarily, but still, I prefer, instead of situational analysis, I favor scenario analysis. What kind of scenarios can we paint for the future? When we speak about the future for the organization, let us think which scenarios can we consider for it? If it is a military political organization, then these scenarios are conceivably oriented to military and political center. For instance, the situation, I would, would have asked very simple questions. In the military doctrine of the Russian Federation, they have some military threats, for instance, NATO is approaching the borders of the of Russian Federation. This is the main military threat for Russia. And uh, naturally, Russia in the CSTO is going to act according to this threat. But the interests of Russia, the CSTO will be linked to this. 
So the question is quite easy. Under the scenario analysis, in what way are we going to consider this problem? In what way the conflict in Ukraine is going to develop? In what way are we considering the future of Belarus? Is it possible to have a local conflict between Russia and NATO? All of these things. If yes, then in what way the uh, article on the collective defense of the CSTO will work? Without such a scenario analysis, it makes no sense to speak about any future of the organization. Next question. Is that possible? And nobody asks these questions under the scenario analysis, for instance, can we consider intergovernmental conflict among the members of the CSTO? See, this is a very provocative topic. But if some military incidents can happen, and they do happen, if there is an external destabilizing factor, which includes the activities of terrorist organizations who can seriously interfere with any conflict situation in Central Asia, then in what way can it change? In what way in what way can it change the overall situation? In what way the CSTO of member states are prepared to curtail uh, or this threats jointly, or they're not prepared to do so and will still be interference with internal politics. So these are kind of scenarios we need to prepare and work through them. In the same manner, we can answer what will happen in Afghanistan, for instance, whether there will be a need to interact between the CSTO countries on the one hand and China and in, from another. Such scenario models within this framework can predetermine aspects of the future development of the CSTO. And I believe this is the chief method which could have been applied here. And as far as the military aspect is concerned, and uh, the military people are always using these algorithms. Generally speaking, if we look at these threats, I believe that the CSTO must remain to be an organization which is targeted at targeting the maintenance of internal stability because of potential internal emergencies and conflicts and so on. The organization of such a type would be capable, I think. But how to do that, most importantly, is to set a task for it to do so. Thank you very much. Within the framework of our project called uh, the World Handcuffed, we would like to prepare such a scenario analysis at the very end. If in an ideal case scenario, the epidemiology, epidemiological situation allows us to do that, of course, the angle will be somewhat broader than simply CSTO, but uh, will include the material of our discussion into it as well. And we'll be in touch with all the panelists of today's discussion and other discussions as well. But now, first of all, I'd like to apologize before those people who have asked the questions, but unfortunately we don't have time to answer them. Although I believe that most of those quite obvious subjects and topics uh, that could have been discussed have been discussed. And I would like to thank all our panelists for that. I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your expertise. A great honor, although virtually, in this virtual space to get together for such discussions. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, redo them again in a more conventional human interaction and atmosphere. And before saying goodbye to everybody, I would like to make a note for all the viewers today that based on the result of this discussion, we'll post the video on those people who would like to uh, clarify some things, can review those videos. So there will be also a textual overview. And everybody is invited for the next week's discussion. Will be next discussion uh, under the World Handcuffed Project will be dedicated to the United Nations, although uh, the time will change. We'll speak about it in the morning.
will give you more energy, hopefully. And before uh, Thursday, uh, next Wednesday, we'll have a very interesting online discussion. will be book launch of Kirill Rudy on China, Chinese Belarusian relations. I simply had to use this moment to plug this book. Thank you very much once again. All the best regards to Moscow, Yerevan, and of course, Berlin. And see you next time. Thank you. Bye.